Hello and welcome. Welcome to Perimeter Institute's public lecture series. My name is Greg Dick. I'm the Senior Director of Advancement and Public Engagement here at Perimeter Institute. Thank you for joining us on another socially distant edition of the series. We are delighted to present a talk by Dr. Emily Real, who has recorded, uh, recorded her lecture from her office at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Real is an Associate Professor of Mathematics at Johns Hopkins. She studied at Harvard and Cambridge and earned her PhD at the University of Chicago. She has recently been awarded the 2020 President's Frontier Award from Johns Hopkins University and the 2021 Joan and Joseph Berman Research Prize in Topology and Geometry from the Association for Women in Mathematics. In addition to her research, Dr. Real is active in promoting access to the world of mathematics and is co-founder of SPECTRA, the Association of LGBT Mathematicians. She has prepared a fascinating talk about a popular mathematical model, the stable marriage problem, and we are excited to share that with you today. Dr. Real, thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Great, thank you very much for that introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here at the Perimeter Institute, which is uh, fun to visit virtually as well as in person. Um, so I know it's been a pretty rough year, so I thought what might be fun to do today is to uh, talk about a nice bit of mathematics that maybe is a dream towards a future where we're, our concerns are things like uh, dating and marriage. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about uh, today is something called the stable marriage problem, and it was posed and solved in a 1962 paper by David Gale and Lloyd Shapley called College Admissions and the Stability of Marriage. So one of the things that I love about this paper is that it's mathematics that uh, doesn't always feel like mathematics. And the authors uh, recognize this. So this is something they wrote in the conclusion of their paper, um, which by the way, is a wonderful read. So they note that it may be convenient to have an illustration at hand to show that mathematics need not be concerned with figures, either numerical or geometrical. For this purpose, we recommend the statement and the proof of our theorem one. So this is something we'll discuss in a minute. Uh, the argument is carried out not in mathematical symbols, but in ordinary English. There, is, there are no obscure technical terms. Knowledge of calculus is not presupposed. In fact, one hardly needs to know how to count. Yet any mathematician will immediately recognize the argument as mathematical. So part of the goal for the day is to broaden uh, our point of view on what counts as mathematics. Okay, so what is this problem? So the stable marriage problem might be described as a matchmaker's dilemma. So what I want to invite us to imagine is a heterosexual dating pool of single men and single women. And the fact that we have kind of two uh, parties in the dating pool that are interested in dating each other is important. We'll discuss that later on. So we have a collection of uh, young men and young women. And the question is whether it's possible to arrange marriages for everyone in the dating pool so that no unmatched couple is tempted to elope. So um, what I'm referring to is, you know, there's a kind of fixed moment in time. We have a group of young men and one young women, and a matchmaker is tasked with arranging marriages for everybody that no one would want to break immediately. So I've drawn this kind of silly cartoon picture here. We have a matched couple, the orange couple, and another matched couple, which is the green couple. And uh, what we're concerned about avoiding is a situation where um, one party in one couple and another party in another couple say the orange woman and the green man, both prefer each other to their assigned spouses. spouses. So that, that's the scenario we're trying to avoid. And so the question is, is it possible to arrange marriages in such a way that this would never occur? Okay, so you know, right now, this is maybe a hypothetical question. To make it into a mathematical question, we're gonna introduce some precise definitions. We're gonna nail down exactly what we mean by all of the words we're using to describe the scenario, and that'll help us reason about this situation mathematically. Okay, so by a dating pool, what I mean is a collection of equal numbers of men and women. Uh, it's actually not so important that there are exactly the same number of men in the dating pool as women, but for now, let's assume that is the case because it makes it a little bit easier to think about. And each member of the dating pool has a fixed preference list, which is a ranking of all of the members of the opposite sex. 
So I've illustrated this here with a dating pool with uh, two men and two women. So Helena and Hermia each have ranked the men, uh, Demetrius and Lysander. You can see they have opposite preferences. And Demetrius and Lysander have also ranked the women. And we're going to assume that that is fixed. So that's not changing over time. Each um, woman in the dating pool has ranked all of the men in order of decreasing order of preference. So from her first choice to her last and vice versa for the men in the dating pool. So by a marriage arrangement, what we're going to mean is it's a heterosexual matching. So I'm going to partition the dating pool into pairs comprised of one man and one woman. And these are the arranged marriages. So an example of an arranged marriage is we could pair up Lysander and Hermia and Demetrius and Helena. Okay, so it's certainly possible to take a dating pool and with equal numbers of men and women and pair them up in some fashion to arrange marriages. But the key question here is whether it's possible to arrange marriages in a stable way. So what do I mean by that? So a, a marriage arrangement is called unstable if there is an unmatched couple who each prefer each other to their assigned spouses. So you can imagine uh, we have a marriage arrangement um, and uh, here I've paired up this orange couple and this green couple. And if we have a member of the orange couple and a member of the green couple who both prefer the other to their assigned spouse, and that's something you would investigate by looking at their respective preference lists, then that's an instability. At the moment the marriages are assigned, this couple would be tempted to run away and elope and break the, break the arrangement. That's what we're trying to avoid. So we'll say that a marriage arrangement is stable if there are no instabilities. So if it never occurs that there is some unmatched couple who both prefer the other to their assigned spouses. Okay, so the question that David Gale posed, that was the start of this paper, was whether it's always possible for any dating pool to arrange stable marriages. And it's really a, a provocative question because I gave one example of a dating pool with two men and two women, but for the general question, there's no bound on the size. We could have thousands of people in the dating pool with, with very, very, very long preference lists. And, um, you know, and also the preference lists can be completely arbitrary. They could be uh, permuted in some fashion, or maybe they all agree. Maybe, uh, you know, there's a uniform ranking of the men, for instance. Um, and the, the question is whether no matter what preferences each individual brings to the dating pool, no matter how many people are in the dating pool, is it always possible to arrange marriages in a stable fashion? Okay. So before we attempt to answer that question, I want to consider a related question uh, that was also addressed in the uh, Gail Shapley paper. So they refer to this as the quote unquote stable roommates problem, uh, which as a lesbian, I find pretty hilarious because what they're obviously talking about is a same sex dating pool. So let's imagine a, a slightly different scenario where uh, instead of having sort of a bipartite dating pool where there's the men and the women who are looking to date each other, we can imagine a dating pool where just everyone's interested in dating whomever. So for instance, we could have Ada, Emmy, Marie, and Vera um, with preference lists as indicated here. The preference lists are a bit different in a same-sex dating pool. Everybody just ranks the other members of the dating pool. And I haven't fully uh, filled out the preference list because it turns out what's important are the rankings that I've spelled out and I'll invite you to supply your own. So the claim is that for this particular dating pool, any marriage arrangement has an instability. So no matter who we match up, there will be some instability. Okay, so if uh, this were a synchronous talk, I would ask somebody to suggest a marriage arrangement for me, but since I'm here all by myself, I'm gonna have to do it. So let's suppose in the end, uh, we have that Emmy is paired with Marie and Ada is paired with Vera. So this would be one marriage arrangement. The matchmaker could decide these are the quote unquote roommate pairs that we'd like to assign. But we can see that there is an instability. So Ada is paired with Vera, which is not her first choice. Indeed, Ada is her last choice. Uh, and she could go to Marie and say uh, that she would rather be roommates with Marie. And indeed, uh, Marie, we can look at her preference list, prefers Ada to her assigned uh, partner, which is Emmy, who would be filled in in the middle here. 
so this is an example where um, the, well, and, and in fact, you can see, I mean, there's some sort of symmetry in this uh, dating, the preference list for this particular dating pool, no matter who ends up paired with Vera is going to prefer um, either of the members of the other uh, couple. And um, there will be at least one person in that couple who would be happier uh, to, to swap. So the reason that we have uh, phrased the, the stable marriage problem so heteronormatively is not just because the paper was written in the 1960s, but in fact, that, uh, that framework where we have uh, two genders and the men are looking to date the women and the women are looking to make the, date the men is gonna be essential for the st stable marriage problem to have a solution. We can see here that in a same-sex dating pool, it might not be possible to find stable marriages. Okay. So what is surprising is that, uh, that the situation is really quite different in the problem as originally posed. So um, in the paper, Gail and Shapley um, proposed something that they called the deferred acceptance algorithm. So this is gonna be an algorithmic solution uh, that um, solves the matchmakers problem. So it's not just uh, hypothetical solution saying, well, we we can pretend that uh, some solution exists. This is gonna be an algorithm that finds, that arranges the marriages. So here's how they describe it. They say, to start, let each boy propose to his favorite girl. Each girl who receives more than one proposal rejects all but her favorite from among those who have proposed to her. However, she does not accept him yet, but keeps him on a string to allow for the possibility that someone better may come along later. Okay, so uh, let's unpack this. And I'm actually gonna flip the role played by the two genders, because after all, it is uh, International Women in Mathematics Day. So let's, let's, I'll describe the algorithm this way. So this is something you could program into a computer. A computer could just read in the preference lists and spit out the matches. But um, I like to describe it via a metaphor where we imagine that all the members in the dating pool are sort of participating. So here's how the algorithm is gonna work. Um, on the first day, say in the morning, each woman, proposes to her top choice suitor. So for each woman in her preference list, there's the number one man, and she is going to propose marriage to that person. So some of the men will receive uh, multiple proposals, others might receive none. And each man who receives more than one proposal will reject all but his favorite of them. So um, if somebody receives three proposals, he'll reject two and keep his favorite and, and the, that couple will become quote unquote tentatively engaged. That's this keeping on a string. Okay. So then in the next day, uh, each woman who was rejected the day before, so the ones whose proposals were rejected who are not tentatively engaged, will then go down on her list. And you know her first choice suitor has uh, rejected her, but she'll propose to her second choice. And what that means is that some of the men will receive new proposals. So maybe somebody is, one of the men is tentatively engaged to somebody else, but receives a few new proposals on the second day. Now the men have an opportunity to trade up. So, uh, if a new proposal is better than one received previously, there's no sort of order of preference. The man just gets to break a previous tentative engagement and enter into a new engagement. And so then this process just continues. So each, on in the morning of each day, the women whose proposals were rejected the day before will propose to their next choice on the list, whoever it is. The men then have an opportunity to uh, trade up. And the claim is that at some point, uh, everyone will become engaged by this procedure. So when we have equal numbers of men and women, there will be some point when everybody is engaged. Nobody is uh, has a broken proposal. And um, that is when the algorithm terminates. Okay, so let's think about an example of this. So to illustrate the example, I've... Uh, considered a hypothetical dating pool. So it has four women, Charlotte, Elizabeth, Jane, and Lydia, and four men with kind of funny names, uh, Bingley, Collins, Darcy, and Wickham. And the preference lists are here. So how does this algorithm work? So on the first day, each of the women proposes to their top choice man. So Charlotte proposes to Bingley, Elizabeth proposes to Wickham, Jane proposes to Bingley, and Lydia proposes to Bingley. So we'll see Wickham receives a single proposal from Elizabeth and Bingley receives three proposals. So from Charlotte, from Jane, and from Lydia. 
Okay, Wickham just receives one proposal. So he is going to be tentatively engaged with Elizabeth. I'll go ahead and record that over here. So Elizabeth becomes tentatively engaged to Wickham on the first day. Bingley receives three proposals, Jane, Lydia, and Charlotte. And of those three, he prefers Jane. So he's going to reject Lydia and reject Charlotte. So Lydia is rejected and Charlotte is rejected. And we have a second tentative engagement as well. So this is Jane to Bingley. Okay, so that's the end of the first day of the algorithm. Now what happens on day two is the women who are rejected on the first day, so that's Charlotte and Lydia, get to propose to their second choice. So Charlotte is going to propose to Darcy. Darcy receives a proposal from Charlotte. While Lydia is going to propose to Wickham. Wickham receives a proposal from Lydia. Now Wickham was tentatively engaged to Elizabeth, but he actually proposes, prefers Lydia, prefers the new proposal. So he's going to reject Elizabeth, and that's going to break that tentative engagement. Uh, but we have a new engagement. So Charlotte has proposed to Darcy. That's Darcy's first proposal. So on day two, we add a new tentative engagement, Charlotte to Darcy. Uh, Jane and Bingley are still matched from the first day, but Elizabeth is uh, no longer matched again. Okay, oh, so right, so we have Charlotte and Darcy, and we also have the new uh, engagement between Lydia and Wickham. Okay, so at the end of the first day, we have three tentative engagements, Bingley to Jane, Darcy to Charlotte, and Lydia and Wickham. Now on day three, Elizabeth was the one who was rejected on the day before, so she proposes to her next choice, which is Darcy. So Darcy receives a new proposal from Elizabeth. Now he had been tentatively engaged with Charlotte, but he prefers the proposal from Elizabeth, so he's going to reject Charlotte. So that's breaking that tentative engagement. And now there's a new tentative engagement. So this is Elizabeth to Darcy. And Elizabeth was the only single at the end of day two. So that's all that happens on day three. Okay, so now on day four, uh, Charlotte has been rejected by Bingley and by Collins. So she, or by Darcy. So she prefer, proposes to her next choice, which is Collins. Collins is receiving this proposal from Charlotte. You can see that Charlotte's actually Collins' last choice, so that wouldn't be the match that he would pick, but he has no other proposals, and so that becomes a tentative engagement. And that's the last of the tentative engagements. So Charlotte is matched with Collins on day four, and now we can see that everybody is engaged. Jane to Bingley, Charlotte to Collins, Elizabeth to Darcy, and Lydia to Wickham. So that is the end of the algorithm. So this is how the deferred acceptance algorithm works. Okay, so, you know, part of the point of the deferred acceptance algorithm is to, you know, arrange marriages, which is what we've done. So remember, a mar marriage arrangement just means that we've matched up the men and women into, into pairs, and that's that's been achieved here by these four couplings. But there was a, this additional desired property of stability. So what we're hoping is that uh, there are no unmatched couple that prefer each other to the arranged marriages that we have here. Now, um, certainly um, individuals in the dating pool have preferences other than their arranged spouse. So if we think about Charlotte, for instance, you know, she would prefer to be with Darcy or Bingley to Collins. But if we look at Darcy, for instance, his assigned spouse is Elizabeth, who he prefers to Charlotte. So that's not an instability. She would run away with him, but he wouldn't run away with her. And similarly, uh, Bingley is matched with Jane, who he prefers to Charlotte. So that's not a source of instability either. We could also look at this from the men's perspective. So um, Collins would rather be with Lydia or Elizabeth or with Jane. But if we look at Jane and Lydia and Elizabeth, their assigned spouses are all somebody they prefer to Collins. So that's not a source of instability. And indeed, you could check every person in this dating pool and see that they are in a stable arrangement. There's uh, nobody that they could successfully run off with. And that's not a coincidence. Uh, that's a general feature of the deferred acceptance algorithm. So this is the first theorem that Gale and Shapley prove. This is the theorem one they were, were referring to in the intro paragraph. It says that the deferred acceptance algorithm arranges stable marriages. So if you can feed in any dating pool whatsoever, no matter how many men and women, no matter what their preference list is, and run this algorithm, and it will find a, find a stable marriage arrangement, which is really pretty remarkable. 
what's also remarkable is that the proof is short and it's actually pretty easy to understand. So let's let's think about it. So um, here's why this is true. So remember the, the sort of cartoon picture of an instability and instability means that we have one assigned couple here in orange, another assigned couple in green, but uh, secretly the woman and one couple and the man in another couple both prefer each other to their assigned spouse. And we're gonna argue that that doesn't occur. And we'll argue it from the point of view of the woman. So what I'm claiming is that no woman could be part of an instability. So why is that? So, uh, you know, a woman in a dating pool, you know, might not have ended up with her top choice man. You know, she might have had a proposal and then had it rejected and then proposed to somebody else and then had it rejected and then proposed to somebody else before she ends up with her assigned husband. So um, there might be other men in the dating pool who she prefers. So that's, that is certainly a possibility for one of the women in the dating pool. But if we remember how the algorithm works, uh, everybody that she prefers to her assigned husband, who's this orange guy over here, is somebody that she proposed to along the way. So she uh, gave this guy in green a chance to be with her, but he um, then rejects her whenever he receives a proposal that he prefers. So the only way that this guy would end up with somebody else other than the orange woman is if he receives another proposal that he prefers. So um, each man that a woman prefers to her assigned spouse rejected her along the way in favor of somebody he likes better. So he's paired with somebody that he prefers to um, the, the woman who prefers him. And so this is not an instability. An instability only arises when both members of an unmatched couple prefer each other to their spouse. And that's not the situation here. And so that's the proof that this is always stable. And there's a corollary, meaning a consequence of this theorem, which says that in any heterosexual dating pool, a stable matching exists. And again, that's really surprising. We saw for same-sex dating pools that this isn't true at all. But uh, for a heterosexual dating pool, it is always possible to find a stable matching. And that's uh, something that I would have not predicted before the reading about the proof of this theorem. Okay, so that's not the end of the story. I mean, we, we did solve the original problem and you know, as mathematicians, we're curious and now there's uh, more that we can say, more that we can investigate. So what we've just learned is that a stable matching exists. So for any heterosexual dating pool, there's always a way to arrange marriages so that they're stable, so that no unmatched couple is tempted to elope. But now that we know that there is a solution to the problem, we could imagine that there are multiple solutions. So we could think about multiple stable marriage arrangements and how they might be compared. So to analyze this, I'm gonna introduce some more terminology. It's always good to pin down your definitions so we can uh, think very clearly about the setting. So um, for a woman in the dating pool, I'm gonna use the phrase best possible husband to refer to the highest ranked man on her preference list who she is matched with in some stable marriage arrangement. So I don't mean that this is just her top choice. That's, that's different from best possible husband. But um, you know, if we have a finite dating pool, then there are only finitely many stable marriage arrangements. And I want to look at all of them and look at all the husbands that a particular woman is paired with in one of those marriage arrangements. And the best possible one is the one of those that she prefers. So, you know, maybe there are three different people she gets matched to in all the various stable marriage arrangements. And the best possible is whichever of the three she thinks is the best. And symmet symmetrically, we'll use the term best possible wife to, for, to refer to the highest ranked woman that a particular man in the dating pool is matched with in any stable marriage arrangement. Okay. So this takes us to the second theorem that was proven by uh, Gale and Shapley, and it's really, really, really surprising. Um, so uh, we'll sort of summarize it by the slogan that when the women propose, the women win, but here's the precise statement. So the deferred acceptance algorithm, that's the algorithm that we just went through where the women sort of propose to their suitors kind of from top down, just going down their list and the men have an opportunity to trade up. So when the women propose, as we've described it, then the result of this algorithm, which is a marriage arrangement, a stable marriage arrangement, so everybody is uh, paired off, 
it assigns each and every woman in the dating pool her best possible husband. So this, this is just completely wild. Um, this particular algorithm, the algorithm that we used to show that the stable marriage problem always has a solution, not only finds a stable marriage arrangement, but simultaneously optimizes the result for every woman in the dating pool. So in the hypothetical universe of all possible husbands for a particular woman, she's given her very best one by this algorithm, but it doesn't just optimize it for one woman, it optimizes it for every single woman. Okay. So the proof of this is a bit delicate, but it's interesting. So I'm gonna take you through it and try and go slowly. Um, so the strategy that we're going to prove, use to prove this theorem is um, something called proof by contradiction. Let me try and explain what that means. So firstly, what we're trying to show is that uh, every woman ends up using the algorithm that we just described with her best possible husband. And if we remember how that algorithm works, you know, the women are proposing firstly to their first choice suitor, then their second choice suitor, and their third choice suitor. And they only move down their list if they're rejected by somebody they propose to. So what we're going to argue is that no woman is rejected by a possible husband. So if, if no woman is ever rejected by somebody who she could be paired with in some marriage arrangement, then the person she ends up with is her best possible husband. That is what we're going to show. And our strategy for showing this is something called uh, proof by contradiction. So um, the way a proof by contradiction works is I'm gonna assume the opposite of what we're trying to show. So I'm going to assume that there is a woman who is rejected by a possible husband and then find something wrong with that assumption. And then I'll know the assumption was necessarily false. So for sake of contradiction, what I'm going to consider is the very first moment in the algorithm, which we described as proceeding along a series of steps. I'm gonna consider the very first moment that a woman, say Helena, is rejected by a possible husband, Demetrius. So I'm gonna imagine the very first time in the running of the algorithm, a man rejects a woman. You know, Maybe there are multiple women who are rejected at the same time, you can just pick one of them. So let's imagine that Demetrius rejects husband and re rejects Helena and Demetrius is a possible husband for Helena. Okay, so the only way that Demetrius would reject Helena is if he receives another proposal that he prefers. So that means there must be some other woman in the dating pool, let's call her Hermia, who proposes to Demetrius and who Demetrius prefers. So Demetrius would rather be with Hermia so if she proposes to him, then he would reject Helena. So that must happen if this possible husband, Demetrius, rejected Helena. Okay, but we're assuming here that Demetrius is a possible husband. So there must be some stable marriage arrangement to say that this is a possible match it means there must be some stable marriage arrangement in which Demetrius and Helena end up together. Now we know that Demetrius prefers Hermia to Helena, so if there is some stable marriage arrangement where Demetrius and Helena end up together, in that particular stable marriage arrangement, Hermia must end up with somebody that she prefers to Demetrius. So that means there must be some fourth person, so some second man, Lysander, who Hermia prefers to Demetrius. Because if they're the only way that this matching between Helena and Demetrius can be stable is if Hermia is matched with somebody she likes even better. But what do we know now? So uh, Hermia must like Lysander better than she likes Demetrius. The only reason she would have ever proposed to Demetrius is if Lysander had rejected her. So um, previous to Hermia's proposal to De uh, Demetrius, Lysander must reject Hermia. And that's a contradiction of our assumption. Remember, we assumed that Helena was the first woman in the dating pool to be rejected by a possible husband. What we've just found is another possible match, Lysander for Hermia, and a rejection that must have happened previously in the algorithm. And that's a contradiction. And that, uh, if you think about it carefully, is the reason why this can never occur. So we've shown then that the, the deferred acceptance algorithm, when the women propose, assigns each and every woman her best possible husband. Okay, so of the surprising results in the Gale and Shapley paper, this I think was the most surprising. Uh, and there's a corollary to it. 
So, you know, here we're using kind of men and women in sort of a metaphorical way to refer to the two groups in the dating pool. We could have the orange people and the green people equally where they don't have to call them men and women. So we could change the variables. We could uh, swap the role of the women and men. In other words, we could have the men act as the proposers and the women, the recipients of the proposal. And uh, by exactly the same argument, if we do the deferred acceptance algorithm, but have the men propose instead, then the result will be to assign each and every man his best possible wife. Okay, so this is, maybe this won't surprise you, this is the sort of framing of the algorithm, the description of the algorithm that Gale and Shapley use in their original paper. They uh, envision the men acting as the proposers, and then they observe this change of variables result, but from the flipped perspective. So they write, it is clear that there's an entirely symmetrical procedure with the girls proposing to the boys, which must also lead to a stable set of marriages. When the boys propose, the result is optimal for boys. When the girls propose, it is optimal for girls. Okay, so this much was known in 1962 in the original paper. Um, but what's really interesting is a third theorem, which is the kind of final main result that I'm going to tell you about. So what we've learned so far is that uh, when the men act as the proposers in the deferred acceptance algorithm, each man is assigned his best possible wife. So the result is simultaneously optimal for the men. So this Gail and Shapley observed, they also observed the symmetric results. So if the women propose instead, then the women have the optimal results. Well, what they failed to consider is what happens to the women in the scenario where the men act as proposers, or in our perspective, what happens to the men when the women propose? So when the women propose, we see that each and every woman is assigned her best possible match, but what happens to the men in that scenario? Well, it turns out, and this also completely blows my mind, that when the women propose, each and every man is assigned his worst possible wife. So um, when the women propose, we've seen that each and every woman is assigned her best possible husband, meaning of all the people she could be matched with in any stable configuration, she gets matched with her, her favorite. And this is true for every woman in the dating pool. But this really comes at a cost to the men in the dating pool. So when the women are assigned their best possible matches, the men are all simultaneously, again, every single one assigned their worst possible matches. And this observation was somehow overlooked in the original paper. Um, but what's surprising about the fact that this is overlooked is the proof of this result is exactly the same as the argument that we gave for the previous theorem. So if we uh, run through exactly the same argument that showed that when the women propose, each woman gets her best possible husband, but think about it from the point of view of the men who are receiving the proposals, we'll observe that the men um, all end up with their worst possible wives. So let's run through this proof again and see if we can see this. So what we're trying to argue is that in the deferred acceptance algorithm with the women proposing again, uh, each man ends up with his worst possible wife. So how will we see this? Well, uh, the only way that a man in the dating pool would end up with somebody better than his sort of worst possible wife is if he rejects his worst possible wife along the way, because um, that's sort of, you know, when you reject, that's giving you an opportunity to trade up. And we're gonna show that that never occurs so that no man rejects a possible wife at any stage in the deferred acceptance algorithm. So we're, again, we're gonna prove this by contradiction. And I'm going to imagine the first moment that there is a man, let's call him Demetrius, who rejects a possible wife. So Demetrius would have an opportunity to reject somebody, Helena, who's a possible wife for him, only if he receives a proposal from another woman, say Hermia, who he prefers. But to say that this first matching was possible, so to say that it's possible in some stable marriage arrangement that Demetrius and Helena end up together, means, since we know that Demetrius prefers Hermia, that there must be another man, Lysander, who Hermia prefers and who's a possible match for her, because this, uh, this is what would create stability in this scenario. So um, Demetrius can stably end up with Helena if Hermia has somebody that she prefers who she'd end up in that scenario. But then the only reason Hermia would have proposed to Demetrius is if she had been rejected previously by Lysander. 
So that means Lysander rejects Hermia previously to when Demetrius rejects Helena. And that's a contradiction to our assumption that Demetrius was the very first man in the dating pool who rejected a possible wife. So once again, we see that this deferred acceptance algorithm with the women acting as the proposers has this very curious property in that it assigns every single woman in the dating pool the best possible match in uh, any stable marriage configuration and also assigns every man in the dating pool the worst possible match in any stable marriage configuration. Okay. So... Uh, that's the end of the original paper. They, in parallel with this uh, marriage question, the sort of matchmaker's dilemma, the authors, uh, Gale and Shapley, um, considered a kind of related college admissions question. So maybe in the context of dating, we can think of this as polyamorous dating, where um, you know, you're trying to match uh, students, say, to colleges, where a college um, might choose to admit multiple students, and a student would have sent just a single college. Um, the authors, though, were skeptical that their mathematical analysis had any real world implications. So they write towards the end of the paper that in making our special assumptions needed in order to analyze our problem mathematically, we necessarily move further away from the original college admissions question. And eventually in discussing the marriage problem, we abandoned reality altogether and entered the world of mathematical make-believe. The practical minded reader may rightfully ask whether any contribution has been made toward the actual solution of the original problem. So um, Gale and Shapley decided sort of ultimately, you know, this mathematics might not be so connected to the real world, but you know, they thought it was beautiful. They thought it could play a role in education and, and sort of broadening perspectives on mathematics. Um, it turns out, however, that on this aspect on their belief that this mathematics had nothing to do with the real world, they were totally wrong. And um, that's where I want to end. So there's something called the medical match. And um, this uh, happens every year, um, every spring, maybe in Canada. So, uh, or is it winter in Canada? I don't know. It's, it happens in, sometime between February and April. But uh, each year, uh, graduating medical students in Canada uh, enter something called the Canadian Residency Matching Program. Uh, they have a wonderful website. Uh, the acronym is C-A-R-M-P, and I highly recommend you check it out. So each year, the graduating medical students, so students who are completing their medical training, uh, enter this matching program. And the aim is that they're going to be assigned to residency programs to sort of specialize in. And um, What's kind of remarkable about this and maybe surprising from the outside is that there's an algorithm. So um, the students sort of enter the matching program, the residency programs enter, enter the matching programs, and then there's something called match day where they just tell you where you're going to go. And that's where your, your job's going to be for the next several years. Um, so there's some computer algorithm that does this matching. And what is that algorithm? It's exactly this deferred acceptance algorithm. So this algorithm is used every year um, to match graduating medical students all across Canada and um, with residency programs for at hospitals. Um, so this happened in the US too. And the, the history in the US is also amusing because this algorithm was actually in use before the Gale and Shapley paper. So when they were wondering about uh, um, you know, whether their kind of new mathematical idea had any uh, real world implications. What they didn't realize is that their mathematical idea wasn't new and in fact was already being used in the real world. Um, so the way I understand this history is that, um, you know, prior to the medical match, there was just chaos. You know, there would be graduating medical students on the phone with hospitals or, you know, writing telegrams and trying to, you um, you know, find a match into a program and, you know, maybe a hospital would make a tentative job offer to a student, but then some better student would come along and everyone would be tempted to sort of break the arrangement. And it was just this very chaotic system. So um, some doctors um, devised this scheme, this algorithm that turns out to be exactly equivalent to the deferred acceptance algorithm. And so it's still used in the US and also in the uh, in Canada. Um, so I uh, there's some important uh, consequences of this for medical students. So firstly, a reassuring thing to know is that in the way the algorithm is 
implemented, uh, the medical students act as the proposers. So the results will be simultaneously optimal for the medical students. So every medical student is guaranteed by entering this medical match, their best possible match. So um, it might not be your first choice, you know, maybe the, your top hospital you know, has other candidates that it prefers to you, but it'll be the best that you could possibly do. And um, this is very, very, very important that the strategy that a student should adopt to try and obtain their best possible match is to list the programs that they want to go to in their true order. So there's no advantage to be gained by falsifying your preference list. You should you know, genuinely list your first program first and your second program second and your third program third and so on and so forth all the way down. That's, that is the best strategy. It's a mathematical theorem that that is the best strategy um, to try and obtain your best possible match. Which is, which is really cool that we can say that with such certainty. Um, so the real world does have one real world complication though, which is that medical students are sometimes married um, and to each other. So now you know, we're, we've moved away from the marriage metaphor that is with uh, students and residency programs, but you know, in real life students might actually be married to each other. And you know, it's a problem if um, you know, you're part of a couple and one of you gets matched in Halifax and the other one gets matched in Vancouver. So. Um, the algorithm allows for this. So there's something called the couples match, which means that a pair of graduating medical students could elect to enter the, the Canadian uh, medical matching program um, as a unit, as a single unit. And what happens in that case is that the medical students will submit a pair of preferences as opposed to individual preferences. So as a couple, they'll say, um, you know, part A would like to be matched to this hospital and would like to be, part B would like to be matched to that hospital and that pair is our first choice. And then there will be a second choice pair and a third choice pair and a fourth choice pair. Um, so that's a, that's a option um, for, uh, you know, medical students who are actually married to each other, for instance. Um, so in practice, this works fairly well. I mean, it's, it's sort of the best solution that uh, the community has devised to try and uh, accommodate, you know, real serious preferences that sometimes, um, you know, you want to be matched near somebody else. Um, unfortunately, the mathematics of the couple's match is considerably more complicated. So there's a theorem from 1990. Ron proved that the couple's match is what's called NP-complete. So informally, what that means is that this is as hard as this very famous class of very, very hard problems in computer science. And in particular, um, you know, might not necessarily have a, a stable solution. Um, but still, it's kind of the best option in practice. Okay, uh, thanks for your attention. I'll leave you with some references and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Real. That was an incredibly interesting journey. Really appreciated that. And thank you to all of you for watching. That was the final lecture of the 2020-21 season of Perimeter's public lecture series, Socially Distanced and All. This lecture series is Perimeter's longest running public outreach program. More than 200 of the world's leading scientists have delivered perimeter lectures since the series began in the early 2000s. And these talks have been seen by millions of curious explorers just like you. We are able to offer these thanks to supporters who share our conviction that scientific literacy and engagement are good for the world. To those who help make this series possible, thank you for being part of the equation. And now, Subscribe to our channel to find hundreds of other science videos and to see what's coming up next. And until next time, stay safe and thanks for watching.